Today, in recognition of National Apprenticeship Week, we are talking about digital apprenticeships. It's vital for economic growth that we develop our digital talent, especially in the face of our divorce from the EU. And yet, the skills gap remains a stubborn feature of the sector. Could apprenticeships be the answer? And how will the imminent arrival of the government's new apprenticeship levy play out and affect your business? Um, you've probably all heard about the new apprenticeship levy, which comes into effect on the 6th of April this year. Um, it's the government's chosen mechanism to increase UK employer spend on apprenticeships training. And it's the biggest single shake up in vocational and professional training in the last 25 years. But what does it mean? <laughs> this is uh, this has got to be a problem for lots of people because you don't, you know, you very often these um, uh, these um, uh, government initiatives, you know, they come wrapped up in a whole load of politi speak, um, you know, the you, you know, in reams and reams of documents and stuff that really is very dull to read. So, Mark, <laughs> what is the levy, and right. how can businesses? get the best of it without it just becoming another tax and without having to read war and peace of legalese, politi politi speak that is going to just send them into a coma. Right. Well, I'll, I'll try not to send you into a coma, Kate. Um, the f first, first thing is to think about this in the context of the broader reforms that, the, that, that are going on in the apprenticeships. We're going to talk later on about some of the standards, which starts to get a bit more interesting. But let's just stick with the, the levy for the, for the minute. First of all, the levy only affects less than 2% of employers in the UK. The only companies that pay the levy are companies who have um, a, a staff um, a salary um, total of more than £3 million a year. That's less than 2% of the total number of companies in the UK. Over 90% of tech companies in any case are, are small and medium price enterprises. So actually the levy only affects in terms of paying it the uh, the big corporates so if you're not a big corporate forget about it because it doesn't affect you that's the first thing the second thing is that the money that does get paid by those big corporates goes into a pot and then that pot be for or to subsidize the training that em for employers when they send people into colleges to do the the training which is part of the apprenticeship Can I just clarify one thing so it's the big corporations who are paying it but yeah. everybody even small um, businesses can draw from that pot yeah so this is the, this this is this is the simple bottom line if you're not a levy payer because your um your pay bill is less than 3 million you can take on an apprentice and the government will pay 90% of the cost of the training that's all you need to know forget the rest of the reams forget all the laws and the regulations the government will pay 90% and you pay 10% that's it Brilliant. OK, so um, I mean, that I think, um, you know, a lot, lots of people have been sort of, you know, throwing their brow about another, so, you know, backdoor tax with this levy. But actually, um, you know, for a, the majority of the businesses who are suffering the skills gap, this could be a really good way for them to skill up um, their people. Let's, let's talk about standards, though, because you, you mentioned this. Um, again, the levy goes alongside reforms, give employers more control over what constitutes an apprenticeship known as standards. How does that work, Mark? OK, so again, there's, it's actually a lot simpler than people often think. It's always the case if you want to access government money to subsidise training or whatever it is, then to some extent you have to dance to the government's tune and there are some rules and you have to meet those rules. Now, those rules used to be set out in things called apprenticeship standards. And if you've ever read one, and I most thoroughly recommend that you don't, uh, you would you would you would find your you'd have to fight your way through a whole load of acronyms and all sorts of stuff and you wouldn't have the first idea particularly as an employer what your apprentice would be able to do at the conclusion of the apprenticeship so the reforms these new things which were originally called trailblazers try and simplify the whole thing and make the rules much much simpler so there's a standard for a particular occupation let's take an example of a software developer there would be two pages very simply two pages which say if you're a software development uh, apprentice apprentice at the end of your apprenticeship here is the things employer defined that you will be able to do an employer an employer who's thinking about taking an apprentice could pick up that two pager and think to themselves well cranky i'd like someone who can do those things so i'll recruit one and in theory a young person could pick it up and think oh cranky I'd like to be one of those. So that's what it is. It's as simple as that. It says employers will define what an apprentice will be able to do 
at the conclusion of an apprenticeship, whether it's a software developer or a, or a, or a cybersecurity person or a network engineer, whatever it is, it's quite simple. It's on two pages. The employer says, I'd like one of those. The young person says, I'd like to be one of those. Where is that information accessible, though? You know, if, if I'm if I'm if I'm thinking about an apprenticeship, where do I go to to find that? Yeah, so um, this is all a, a very important part of it, that making sure that people are, are aware. And one of the things that the Tech Partnership is very keen to do through our employer network, over a thousand strong, is to go out into schools and other places and make sure that people understand. Uh, if you wanted to have a look, if you go onto the uh, Skills Funding Agency website, or you can just you can just Google it. If you just put software developer uh, apprenticeship standards, then you'll find your way to it and you'll find that two pager and, and there it is. So um, we still need a lot more work to do. And it's still the case. We know that when we talk to apprentices, very often they say they're doing an apprenticeship, not because of the advice they were given at school, but despite the advice they were given at school. So there's still work to do in terms of making sure that schools recognize the benefits of doing an apprenticeship, particularly we're talking about um, uh, digital apprenticeships. I mean, the, the average salary of a technology professional is 37% above the average salary across the whole economy. There are all sorts of exciting jobs, not just on, in technology companies, but across the board. So all of these messages are very important. So I think that the government reforms, the kind of plumbing of the government reforms, if you like, is making the system much, much better. What we've got to do is change the culture, and that's a harder and longer term thing. Yeah, and of course, another big benefit is you don't leave university with a massive amount of yoke of debt around your neck. Um, well, nowadays, nowadays, of course, you can you can even do degree apprenticeships. So uh, the, the, this binary choice of doing an apprenticeship or getting a degree, that's gone. You can do a degree apprenticeship. You spend about 90, 80 percent of your work time actually learning on the job in your in your job being paid for it. And the other 20% you go and sit in a classroom, but that classroom is a university classroom. At the end of your four years or whatever it is, you've got um, bags of work experience, you've been paid for three or four years, you've got a degree and you haven't paid a penny.